Hi, I'm Dr. Emily Block, and today I'm going to talk about three broad types of decision-making models. Each work in different information environments and have different benefits and drawbacks. Before we get into the models, I want to start by differentiating two different types of decisions, programmed and non-programmed decisions. Program decisions are repetitive and well-defined. There are procedures that exist for resolving the problem. For example, the decision of what to wear in the morning. It's a problem that's clear in scope and it's clear in parameters. I have to consider what am I going to be doing that day, what the weather's like, what clothes are clean in my closet. I face the same problem day in and day out. These program decisions have a reliable set of outcomes and don't require any deep decision-making skills. In contrast, Non-program decisions are novel, they're unstructured, and we don't have preset procedures to solve the problem. They are the types of decisions that we need to learn to categorize. In this video, I'm going to describe three broad ways of making decisions. My hope is, by understanding these models, you'll be able to better classify your unprogrammed decisions and take advantage of the best process to make these tough decisions. The first model is deductive reasoning. Many of you are familiar with deductive models from the scientific method. It's where you start with a general statement or hypothesis and follow that to evaluate the possibilities to reach a logical conclusion. Let's take an example, like when you're trying to find a romantic partner. You're testing each candidate against the core premise, you're the right person to be with, and you continue going through candidates until you find one that works for you. Using the deductive process, you go from the general, I want a partner, to the specific, are you my person? And you have a defined problem with a number of alternative solutions, and your challenge is to apply a rational decision-making frame to find the best partner. Now, I want to make it clear that I'm not associating deductive reasoning with the logic of economic rationality. I don't believe that there's one right person in the whole world, and that you have to go through all of the candidates to find the optimal perfect person. It's totally reasonable to use bounded rationality. That's the concept that someone's good enough when the costs of further search outweigh the marginal improvements in quality. With deductive reasoning, conclusions are either right or wrong. This is or is not the right person. How romantic. When following a deductive approach, remember the three Ds, define, disaggregate, and data. Under define, you first have to identify the problem. Do you really want a partner? Or do you just want someone to have dinner with, like a roommate, or something warm to snuggle with at night? Would a cat do? Most deductive decisions fall apart at this stage. Make sure you're asking the right questions, because without the right question, there's no way to get the right answer. Next, you work to disaggregate the problem. What are your decision criteria? Sense of humor? Will they tolerate your cat? Do they like to travel? Is there that spark? Are these criteria equally important? I mean, I can travel by myself, but I'm definitely not getting rid of my cat. Then you move on to the third step, which is data, generating alternatives. And in this case, it means actually dating real people rather than just imagining the perfect person inside your head. And as you meet more people, you're able to compare them to the criteria and select the right candidate. The challenge here is to figure out when good enough is both good and enough. That's when you stop searching. Remember, this model also reminds you to reevaluate the decision after it's implemented. Here's an example of the limits of deductive reasoning and the potential for inductive reasoning to step in. I was doing a project with my MBA students in Cambodia for a big international NGO. They were trying to figure out why Cambodian children had higher rates of stunted growth than children in other countries with similar climates and levels of development. After consulting with many experts, our NGO partner came, to, came up with a hypothesis that the matriarchal nature of Cambodian homes, where after marriage many couples live with the wife's family and not the husband's, gives grandmothers a lot of influence on what kids eat. And therefore, targeting a new mom with the best and latest and greatest nutritional information isn't transferring onto kids' plates because grandmothers are driving what's being served. What they wanted us to do was help develop a training program for grandmothers around child nutrition. It made a lot of sense. We landed in Cambodia, armed with our hypothesis, it's the grandmothers, and our solution, train the grandmothers, and went out into the villages to identify the right training sites. We met with and were hosted by families, staying with them overnight, sharing meals. It was an amazing trip. 
But the problem was, we didn't see what we expected. Grandmothers heavy-handedly throwing out veggies in favor of traditional rice porridge for kids? This shows us the limits of deductive reasoning. If you don't have the right hypothesis, you're not going to come up with an effective solution. What did we do? We switched to an inductive approach. If deductive reasoning starts from the broad and narrows down to the specific, inductive decision making is the exact opposite, starting from the specific details and aggregating up to the general. Inductive approaches favor poorly defined problems. You're not testing solutions against a hypothetical end state. You're trying to figure out from data and observations what the end state should be. You start from an inductive place if you don't have a strong theoretical rationale for a hypothesis and you want your thinking to reflect the conditions on the ground. This means we make many observations and use those observations to observe a pattern to infer an explanation for what you're seeing. And once you observe these patterns, you can generalize more broadly. In Cambodia, we went back to basics with our inductive approach. We changed our question from, are grandmothers influencing what kids eat, to what are some of the nutritional habits that may lead to stunting in the families that we're studying? From that, we saw a number of patterns, including long commutes, irregular work hours, the increase in households owning pigs, and cash crop farming that we used to theorize what was shaping nutrition patterns. In fact, inductive and deductive reasoning can really work together hand in hand in science. We couldn't assess the truth of these observations, but the more families we observed, the stronger our conclusions became, which then in turn led to hypotheses that we could then test through deduction. Just like asking the wrong questions is a pitfall for deductive problem solving, there are a number of challenges that can mess up an inductive process. The first is incomplete information. Is the pattern that you are observing being driven by looking at too few observations? For example, let's say you have a bag of coins and you pull out three coins from the bag and each coin is a penny. Using an inductive logic, you might then propose that all of the coins in the bags are pennies. Have you pulled enough coins to make that conclusion? A second challenge is your bias sample. In Cambodia, we wanted to make sure that we weren't just picking families who were similar to one another, but instead engaged in purposeful sampling to try and probe differences. We talked to rural families and urban families, large and small families, more or less wealthy families. We even observed that on one of the villages, one of the sides of the street, the ground was really dry and the other side of the street, the ground was really flooded. And so we asked, did the side of the street matter? Inductive decision making involves not just looking for the average person, but looking for the exceptions. Finally, with inductive data, you want to make sure that you're not just hearing what you want to hear or what people think you want to hear. This means using multiple data collection methods, not just interviewing, but walking around, observing, using these multiple sources of data in order to triangulate and support your conclusions. Finally, a third way we make decisions is through intuition. People talk a lot about intuitive decision making. They say things like, I just knew it, or it feels right. And there are a lot of business stories about the titans of industry like Henry Ford and Bill Allen from Boeing really trusting their gut and having these decisions pay off. I'm going to argue that sometimes your gut is right and sometimes you're just having a stomach ache and there is a way to know the difference. Sometimes when we get a gut feeling, we're tapping into a hunch. We have our diverse life experiences, they're stored in our memories and our brains just combine these experiences in complex ways to produce a judgment or a choice that just feels right. But just because it feels right doesn't mean that it's not risky. These holistic hunches are essentially your opinion and they should be validated inductively or deductively if it's a risky decision. But there are other times when your gut feeling can be really trusted. That's when it's a reflection of automatic expertise. I used to play the piano when I was younger. I never really learned to read music and only played by ear. I eventually quit, which I totally regretted. A few nights ago, I sat down at the piano and after a few minutes of trying to figure out on my own what keys to start with, I found myself playing Canon and D. I hadn't played that piece in like 10 years, but somehow my fingers just did it, or at least the first few bars of it. That's an example of automated expertise and decisions based on this type of programmed and repetitive learning are actually really effective in making good decisions. Doctors, firefighters, the military, all are trained to recognize familiar situations and to react automatically 
through repetition so that when they're faced with the situation in real life, they're able to do what feels right rather than not having to think about it. So when you get a hunch, ask yourself, is this a product of my repetitive experience or is this just my preference masking as a feeling? Trust the former. I hope these three approaches to decision models are useful in helping you figure out which approach to take when you make decisions, big or small. Thanks for watching.